All right. Well, th thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so I'm uh, uh, basically I I gave a selection DAG focused back end tutorial. I guess a number of years ago now. I think back in 2018 um, at the US LVM Dev meeting, and I felt it might be worthwhile trying to do something a bit similar for Global iCell. Um, I should say my level experience with Global iCell is vastly different versus selection DAG. I've been doing selection DAG based backend stuff for 12, 13 years with different levels of intensity, upstream and downstream. Um, Global iCell is much more recent for me and looking around the room, I think there are a few people who definitely know much more about it than I do. So if there are any particularly tricky questions then there should be more people in the audience who can help out. Um, uh, and I'm trying to, I'm gonna try and keep this somewhat accessible to someone who hasn't necessarily worked on the back end before. Um, obviously LLVM is a huge infrastructure. Some of us focus more on the back end, some on the middle, some on the front end. Um, I'll make some comparisons to selection DAG when I think it's helpful, but hopefully it shouldn't be a requirement to um, understand my point. Uh, great. Um, so in terms of, you know, I'll try and give a kind of high level overview of the key bits of global ISL as I see it. we will step through a small number of um, or a few kind of targeted examples and then um, kind of look in a little bit more detail about the practicalities of how to go about enabling global ISL for a, a specific backend. Um, I've, I'm not going to try and be exhaustive in terms of those kind of changes because um, there's been previous tutorials um, that have taken that approach and there's also you know, other patch, a series of patches that you can look at. I've got a number of references to point to at the end of this uh, presentation it should be useful there. Um, and there should be hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so if I, if I say something that um, makes absolutely no sense to you at all, then do put your hand up and I can stop and try and figure it out. So in terms of what is global ICEL, um, the most, ba most basic terms, breaking down the name, um, global refers to how it operates on the whole function rather than a single basic block. ICEL is instruction selection, this task of, you know, it's fitting into a compiler pipeline, take, you know, in a traditional selection DAG flow, I'm thinking it, you know, in terms of, you know, what you're going from, you're going from, in a simplified way at least, from C to LVM IR. This gets translated into selection DAG. There's a series of, um, I guess, smaller sub passes, um, you know, quite a lot hidden within that selection DAG term. It eventually gets spat out at the other end as um, target specific machine instructions. And if you implement the MC layer, um, you can then emit it as, you know, say an ELF object file. Um, a, uh, you know, global iCell is fitting into that same part of the compilation pipeline. Um, the key difference here being that, um, you know, rather than translating to a separate um, to a separate IR to selection DAG, then to machine instructions, um, we translate directly to machine instructions from the start, but to a generic form of machine instructions, which can then, as we'll you know, step through shortly, um, get translate gets uh, selected towards the um, what we're trying to emit for the target. And as I comment here, um, you know, global iCell you know, being called, you know, global, that's the most, um, I guess, noticeable feature of it. But I think probably the use of machine IR and machine instructions is really the most notable aspect of it. Um, you know, focusing on the fact that it has, um, you can select beyond a single basic block. It's a nice feature, but probably not the defining feature to focus on. Um, so I mentioned uh, machine IR and machine instructions a few times. What is MIR? Uh, it's just a serialization of a machine function or a series of machine functions into a YAML container, which might optionally contain um, the uh, an embedded the LVMIR module as the first document, um, and the following documents are serialized machine functions within that module, um, and. This is something that if you've done back-end work, even if you haven't touched global ISL at all, you may well have seen it already. Um, it's often helpful outside of global ISL context for anything where you want to perform, um, at, commit some kind of tests on um, you know, properties uh, at the machine IR level, um, so yeah, in, on, you know, properties of machine functions and that kind of thing. So I've, the, the example um, MIR, a uh, document they have on this slide is actually just taken from an existing non-global ICEL RISC-V backend um, test. And you'll see a number of them splattered um, around the LVM repo. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a, a common container that's used throughout the entire global ICEL process, uh, which is we'll you know, touch on is particularly useful when it comes to um, you know, testability and inspectability. 
um, you know, again, just you know, covering a few of the, you know, the basics of people who may not have encountered it so far. You know, why was global ISL produced? Um, you know, for more details, you can see as a, a very solid documentation on that, as well as the previous presentations. But the key, the, the three key highlights that are picked out there are. Firstly, performance. So by avoiding this step of introducing a separate intermediate representation, then going to machine instructions, the idea is that it should provide um, faster um, code gen. Uh, the granularity, the global aspect, being able to operate on the whole function rather than individual basic blocks um, offers you know, more potentially more opportunities for optimizations. It may simplify some things. Um, if you've ended up done work with selection DAG, um, sometimes you end up doing some slightly ugly things to try and um, sync or hoist uh, instructions to try and um, modify what either make uh, selection DAG see something that you wanted to see or to hide something that you don't want it to see. Uh, and also modularity, um, being able to uh, reuse more code between um, uh, for instruction selection with uh, different targets. So, um, you know, fast ICEL is another instruction selector that lives within LVM targeted at, say, O0. Um, the idea is that, you know, global ICEL can be used in both O0 and optimizing modes with a much higher amounts of code reuse rather than having a completely separate infrastructure. So how does global ICEL work? These are the key, um, I guess, you know, passes within it. It's actually very flexible, um, so I'll, I'll touch on later. And if you look at the what's been said about, um, say, the ARCH64 work, which is probably the most mature, um, so certainly the most mature uh, global ICEL backend targeting a CPU, um, you can add, go and you may want to go in and add in extra passes to enhance this, but the, the key ones are there in bold. The IR translator, translating LVM IR to generic uh, machine IR, uh, somewhat analogous to the selection DAG builder. Um, the legalizer, support, replacing unsupported operations with those which are supported. Um, this is if, uh, you know, both in terms of unsupported for due to having an unsupported type or because the operation isn't natively supported. Um, the register bank selector, which I'll touch on a little bit later, uh, um, it's around assigning register banks to virtual registers. And finally, the instruction selector, uh, which is, I guess, the, the bit that which we really care about taking the, um, uh, you know, go, selecting the appropriate target instructions um, based on all the work that we've done um, so far through this process. Uh, and then within the middle there, you see two runs of a, um, of a combiner. Uh, similar to selection DAG, that it's useful after some of these passes to go and um, uh, replace some instructions with a, a better sequence that may be um, expected to be faster or for smaller code size. Um, the output of every single one of the, every single one of these passes is machine IR, which means that it's you know, easy to go and write specific tests. Um, as I'll, I'll outline a little bit later, you can just have a LLC invocation. You ask it to stop before a certain pass, and you're able to dump the MIR at that point. Um, I'm in. This is is a, a very useful capability to have. Um, I'm. I guess new to global ICEL, but still, from what I've, I've played around with it so far, I'd say it's maybe not always something to jump to. In that, throughout LVM, we often do have fairly kind of coarse-grained, high-level tests, like um, say from C to LVM IR, or from you know .LL through to generated assembly. Um, I don't think that's a bad way of testing. In many ways, it's a very productive way of testing. So it's, I think, a uh, a judgment call about when it makes sense to go and you know, write a more constrained test because there's something that you really, really care about um, versus sticking with one which is more um, you know, high level rather than over constraining your tests and thus creating more review burden and maintainability issues if the internal implementation details change. Um, so I think you know one of the changes which uh, the more recent work on AR64 did was to add an additional lowering pass after legalization, um, with the thinking being that you sometimes want to convert from some generic operations to another, and it was you know fiddly to try and do this all in one go within the instruction selector, as I understand it. So it kind of splits instruction selection between multiple passes. Um, I guess it'll be interesting to explore if that makes sense for other backends like RISC V, whether these become kind of part of the standard pipeline, or whether it's just a, a property of global ISL that's more flexible and it's easier to pick and choose these things if it makes sense for your particular target. <laughs> 
Um, I won't go through his selection DAG pipeline in in detail, but you can see that it's it's not fundamentally different. You know, we have the steps of you know, building the initial DAG, and we go through the DAG combiner multiple times after the initial build, after the initial DAG generation, um, after the uh, legalization, which is split in the selection DAG world between legalizing by operation and uh, and legalizing by type, um, and through the final you know instruction selection and and so on. Um, and you might also recall that CodeGen Prepare runs prior to selection DAG, so that you know, remains something that we have. Um, you know, that's on the LVMIR level, making some final um, you know, tweaks or modifications prior to you know, going through instruction selection. I'm not sure to what extent it's been audited for things that might, you might want to change with global ICEL in mind. Um, certainly, I can think of a few cases where um, you know, CodeGen Prepare is syncing or hoisting things with uh, selection DAG in mind, so there might be you know, some further tweaks that could be made there. Uh, in terms of global ICEL status, uh, which you know, full disclaimer, I'm you know, I'm relaying stuff that's available elsewhere. I'll kind of outline it because it's useful background. Um, I was also helpfully corrected that um, so basically there was a previous talk in 2021 about bringing up global ICEL for optimized AR64 code gen. Previously, it had been mainly used for O0. A later RSC about enabling it by default for you know O0 to O3 to the Apple AR64 platforms. That landed. I understand it was later reverted, and I don't think it was recommitted. But someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but this was a really interesting discussion, RSC process, be, um, as well as the presentation, because it highlighted where global ICEL stands versus selection DAG for at least you know those you know benchmarks that were being used there. So it's you know was within one percent of selection DAG geomean for both performance and code size metrics, um, and the hoped for compile time improvements were present in that if you're just comparing the um, you know the selection DAG equivalent bit, then it's 2.5 times faster, you know, varying depending on what you're doing. Um, but of course, due to Amdahl's law, um, you know, when you map that to a full compilation pipeline, it's a much smaller percentage, more like 5%. Um, another aspect um, that you'll see here is this mention of a fallback rate. Um, there is an ability to fall back to the selection DAG if you're not able to um, compile a function using global ICEL. Um, my understanding is that there isn't currently any scalable vector support within global ICEL, so that remains a, you know, some, a gap. We're a long way to looking at it on the RISC V side, and um, I, I imagine um, it may be reached before us on the, AR, on the ARM AR64 side. And um, I'd be interested to chat to anybody afterwards, but I, I, I mean, based on the discussion so far, I understand that although there may be some code gen improvements due to the global scope, um, they haven't kind of because of all the engineering work to try and ensure that all of the combines that were done that are done for selection DAG and for global ICEL, it could be that part of that is just you know compensating for not all those things having been implemented. Um, certainly, it's not currently generating better code in general than selection DAG. Um, in the end, I think this presentation touches on relatively few RISC-V specific aspects, but a very quick, quick rundown. It's a modern RISC-V IS, RISC ISA with an open specification. Uh, it has kind of, uh, well, several base ISAs, one in 32-bit, one which is 64-bit. Um, it's broken up into a large number of ISA extensions, um, referred to with a, you know, a rather handful of a string, you know, RV64, IMA, FTC, for instance, indicating, um, among other things, support for single and double precision floating point and atomics. Um, but it, the individual cores may not implement those extensions, so it's a backend that needs to support all of those variations. So you know, soft float, hard float, as you can see the list of APIs, a whole bunch of different APIs. And oh, that's coming. And just as a, I mean, the, the details don't matter so much here. Just a reminder of the MC layer, or how that, or how instruction definitions look in table gen. This is a, a flattened table gen description of a, a simple instruction. Um, so if you're you know, wondering what you're trying to select and how that's represented within LVM, you have a definition of an instruction, which if you implement the, M the MC layer, will have a full description of its uh, encoding, um, but importantly also information about its, um, its operands, so whether it's uh, the GPP uh, inputs and outputs and so on. <clears throat> So in terms of uh, you know 
we're starting in the middle a little bit here rather than trying to build up from uh, you know, the plumbing work that you might need to do to get global iSell work in your back end. As I mentioned before, and I, I, I think it's really important to highlight this, the IR translator is producing generic machine IR. If you're used to selection DAG, you, you might remember that's generating a whole bunch of um, you know, stand of target independent selection DAG nodes. The I guess functional equivalent here, are, are, you are generating machine instructions, um, but there's a whole range of target independent machine instructions, which all have the G underscore prefix, which are being produced, which will later be converted to the target specific machine instructions. Uh, so we want to go from a, you know, we've started with say an, an add instruction at the LLM IR level, that's gone through the IR translator, you, it produces a, a G underscore add, and we ultimately want the instruction selector to pick up uh, to recognize that can be replaced with a RISC-V add instruction. Um, the core of that is, in, is handled by um, you know, the RISC-V instruction selector, um, has a, a, function, a select function. Again, you'll see fairly obvious parallels to uh, selection DAG if you worked with that before. Um, that can call out to a table generated implementation of select, but you can also add in, um, you know, there's some handling of non-generic instructions that you typically need to handle, like the copy instruction. Um, you may want to have some handwritten selects that don't that aren't generated that aren't generated by table gen, um, but then otherwise you can fall back to the table gen version. Um, and how that works is, um, you know, there's ability to import selection DAG patterns. So a selection DAG pattern implemented in terms of the, or specified in terms of the add selection DAG node um, can be uh, imported uh, to global iSell. Um, so, you know, the mechanism for that, uh, you'll see there's a selection DAG combat.td file has a whole bunch of these G inode equiv declarations. In this case, it's indicating that a G underscore add is equivalent to the add selection DAG node. And so that replacement can be made in the patterns so that an appropriate, um, the appropriate matching code can be produced. And that's, you know, this is what you'd want to do if you're defining your own custom SD nodes, which are mapping to say target pseudo instructions. Um, there's a few caveats around this. Uh, if you're using complex patterns, which you typically do for say addressing modes, those are, you'll have some matching C++ code, which is implemented in terms of selection DAG nodes. Uh, there's a, you know, a process to define a functionally equivalent uh, logic, which implements that complex pattern, but is uh, GI cell compatible. Um, and similarly, but much more straightforward, because uh, I think most users of Patleaf have probably been replaced by now. Um, if you are using Patleaf, there's Imleaf, Intimleaf, and FPMleaf, which um, you commonly use them for, uh, say, the immediate operands for instructions, and the um, you know those latter set of patterns are all specified in terms of, say, AP int or AP float, as opposed to operating on selection DAG nodes, which we clearly don't have in the global ICL case. Um, so stepping back, uh, so, so that's kind of a, the fundamental bit that you want to achieve at the end of the day. Um, as I see it, kind of everything else is um, you know, just work you need to do to try and make that possible. Um, so all the work to try and uh, integrate into the back end as well as performing or enabling all the legalization steps so that you actually produce something sensible that you're able to go and go and select. Um, uh, this is done with legalization. Uh, we want to transform you know, both use of types as well as any opera operations. Uh, key references there would be the target specific um, legalizer info implement uh, file, um, the get action definitions builder API, um, which is kind of where you specify most of the behavior for, for this legalization. Um, also handy to take a look at the legalize action enum, um, which indicates the kind of options that there are for legalizing something, whether that's generating a libcore or doing some custom legalization or otherwise, you then need to kind of go and map that back to the um, get action definitions builder API. Uh, in this case, is an example from RIS5 where it's specifying that for either a GAD or a GSUB, it's legal for types which are of XLEN length. Um, that's RISC V terminology. It's either it's a, a 32-bit scalar on RV32 or a 64-bit scalar on RV64. Um, there's a slight um, tweak on that in that there's some custom uh, legalization for 
32 bits types on RV on RV64, as we have a kind of, kind of special handling around that. Um, and then, uh, you know, clamp scaler is indicating that it's only it, it, they're only legal for those XLN types. Uh, the uh, do I mention that? Oh yes, I talked about it a little bit more. So the um, if that custom four predicate is satisfied, so we have a type which is a uh, a 32 bit scalar, uh, then the legalized custom function which you've provided as part of your um, legalizer info uh, file uh, as dispatched and you can kind of handle the legalization with um, with custom logic. Um, one thing to highlight here is the use of LLTs or low level types, which are meant to replace the usage of extended value types as you might see of selection tag and a Maybe slightly surprising difference there is that um, these low level these types are specified in terms of whether they're scalar, whether they're vector, and their width, but um, it doesn't differentiate, for instance, between um, float and integer values. So a, a float is a s thirty is a is an s thirty two as is a int thirty two. Um, and uh, you know, there's, as you'd imagine, a lot of shared logic in the shared global ISO legalizer helper, so that you don't have to go and implement the exact same legalization routines for every single target. Um, I probably won't talk through this in in depth, but um, you know, you'll you, you'll commonly kind of have the need to legalize types which are wider than native width. This is one of those cases where. Um, Global ISL introduces a few extra instructions to help represent that. In this case, a G merge values and unmerge values so that you can produce an S64 value in this case and then um, split it out again to 32-bit uh, to separate 32-bit values so it can be returned. Um, and register banks are perhaps, uh, uh, I guess, maybe initially most confusing aspect. I'm, I'm not sure I've, I'm doing the best. I have the best job of. Uh, explaining how, how how it works in practice, and it's maybe the bit that's not documented quite as well as other parts of global ISL. Um, so, as I understand it, you know, targets commonly, well, maybe starting from how they're actually used. You know, typically um, on a, a process, you'll often have a bunch of general purpose registers and a bunch of floating point registers, um, and you know, those are those are, would normally be your two separate uh, register banks. There's a cost to translating, to, to copying between the, the two of them. Some operations will only make sense on those, uh, can only be performed directly on a value in those in those register banks, you have to copy it otherwise. Uh, a floating point add, for instance, you'd, um, you know, that will only, you only have instructions so it can operate on that, but a uh, um, but a, a load or a store could, you know, easily be either to using the floating, the uh, FPR register bank or the GPR register bank, and you'd want to select the right one depending on, um, you know, how it gets gets used elsewhere. Um, is I, I mentioned before that the low level types are specified in terms of the uh, the width. Um, you can, of course, in you can determine uh, the types needed types in many cases because that is not the case. We have a fully polymorphic um, G add or anything. You know, you have a there's an integer G add, there's a floating point G F add as well, and so um, specifying the appropriate uh, register constraints is you know, relatively straightforward in those cases. Uh, right. So now. Um, Oh yes. Yeah. So I think this is this is a case where we're actually not there yet on uh, on the RISC five side in terms of implementing support for um, the floating point instructions. This is an example of uh, from PPC, which has a really great, um, very readable set of patches implementing global ISL support. I definitely recommend having a look. Um, where it's a, a snippet from. Get instra mapping, which is part of this reg bank select code, which is, as you can see, is indicating um, the uh, uh, that these you know floating point instructions use floating point registers and interrogating the uh, the width of the um, you know, based on the width of the value which is used. In terms of what you need to do to build up global ISL support in a backend, there's a few examples you can look at. The initial um, tutorial that was using BPF, um, the RIS-5 patch patches, um, as well as the PPC ones. Uh, it's, it's possible to do a very, very minimal initial support. 
Um, so you need to implement um, risk five call lowering in our in our case, risk five instruction selector, risk five legalizer info, and risk five register bank handling code. Um, but almost all of these can be handled with either you know no logic or near to no logic to just support the basic empty function returning void case. You know this is just getting something that compiles and and, and is testable to some degree. So risk five call lowering has um, you know support for returns, formal arguments, performing an actual call. Um, this is something which is called by IR translator. I mentioned at the beginning, translating your selection, your LVM IR to, um, uh, to GMIR nodes. Uh, the initial select can just you know, full call select impl. Uh, there's not really any need for risk five legalizer info for the baseline implementation. Uh, and a, a basic definition of GPR register bank should be sufficient. Uh, of course, as we're adding anything, you'll need to add a little bit of um, uh, a little a little bit of infrastructure around you know cmakelist.txt, adding the passes to risk five target machine, the get, necessary getters and initializers to risk five sub target, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so in terms of that risk five call lowering, this is another case where there's a number of helpers that um, you know, mean that you don't need to reinvent the world each time. Uh, you're responsible for implementing ingoing and outgoing uh, value handlers to specify how to, you know, for cases where say a, a value is passed via the stack or via the register. Um, in this case, I've copied a implementation of the call return handler um, assign value to reg function. So this is where you have a, a you're, you're taking a value which is returned from a call. It needs to be copied into a um, from a physical register to a virtual to a virtual register. I guess another notable point that um, I guess wasn't obvious to me the first time that I went through global ICEL, but it is actually covered fairly well in the documentation, um, is that the IR translator actually lowers constants constants to specific um, kind of synthetic instructions, G constant or GF constant. Um, that gives a fair bit of flexibility in terms of how they're handled, either folding them into immediate operands when you're doing instruction selection, um, but also there's some, uh, you know, there's Choices about where you place those, um, where you place those uh, that G constant or GF constant instructions. Because if you um, hoist them up to the, um, so they have the largest live range possible, you're increasing register pressure. And so there's things like a localizer pass to try and minimize that live range, if necessary. Um, uh, in our case, for the RIS five backend, um, we actually have some shared logic for generating. Uh, at least the best of our ability, optimal sequences for generalizing, for ma materializing integers um, that shared between uh, the selection DAG and the MC layer, because um, there's a uh, an, an assembly level pseudo instruction for generate for loading a constant, um, and that can just be called and, and used here from uh, global ICEL for the uh, select constant implementation. A few very general thoughts on kind of getting into a productive edit compile test loop initially the things that aren't particularly specific to global ICEL um, you know looking at the existing entry tests is always very helpful um, I'm a big fan of update LC test checks and update MIR test checks I think for MIR it's used almost exclusively as it's fairly um, it, it's, uh, it's somewhat harder to kind of handwrite all of your MIR tests versus doing it with um, uh, with LVMIR and the checking of the um, generated assembly instructions. Um, I find it for the, for the LLC test, I also find it incredibly useful. For the RISC-V backend, we use it for almost every t almost every test. It's uh, generated by update LLC test checks, um, get to, into a habit of, of checking, checking things in, uh, checking in a test ahead of time before then posting a patch which implements a new optimization or combine. It's easy for reviewers to see what's changed just to looking at the diff. Um, so again, get a workflow with Git and uh, and shit looking at diffs works very well here. Even if sometimes it's generating, you have you're, you're matching quite a lot more code than you would otherwise if you were trying to manually, um, uh, I guess, minimize the test. But overall, it seems to save a fair bit of time. Uh, you of course want to ensure you have a debug and asserts build. 
Um, Dash debug and Dash print after all to LLC remain you know, incredibly useful for global ICLs for everything else. And then all the usual tools that you might, you might use in terms of debugging. Uh, there's a few global ICL specific options that are handy. Uh, so you're able to control um, that mechanism I mentioned before about falling back to the selection DAG, the dash global ICL abort option, uh, which you'll almost certainly want to control in, uh, in your tests. Um, there's, you can either disable it altogether, disable the, sorry, allow the fallback button to disable the abort or enable the fall, or enable the fallback or to allow it, but to ensure that a diagnostic's always omitted. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, dash run pass and, pass and dash stop after. Uh, it's very helpful to be able to, uh, you know, to generate your MIR of the first case for a test that you want to commit and check in. Uh, you can have your LVMIR, use dash stop after for the pass that, you're, that you, that you, um, you know, want to use to produce your input MIR, put that in a file, and then you can write your uh, test in terms of a, you know, by running just that pass specifically. There's also some options to explore around simplifying the MIR um, to try and make it more minim minimal. Um, and I guess looping back to discussion around imported selection DAG um, patterns or, um, or this globalized cell abort mechanism, passing in dash dash stats to LVM table gen can give you stats on the patterns emitted and importantly, the ones which can't be imported. And then one on skip will give you more details about why they couldn't be imported. In terms of optimizations, uh, this isn't we're, we're some way away from exploring further optimizations beyond um, you know, just the standard uh, what's provided by Global ICEL by default. ART64 has some entry examples. You can look at the pre-legalizer combiner and the post-legalizer combiner. Um, there's also a mechanism whereby you can define part of the matching rules in table gen. You can see ART64 combine.td. Um, and you know, in this example, it's performing you know, folding of um, you know, offsets to globals and this you know, match fold global offset and apply fold global offset. These are functions within that um, you know, ARC64 pre-legalizer combiner file. Um, a few general observations or things that for me are, are open questions. Uh, I think it's been commented before that we're maybe within LVM lacking a, a reference global ICEL backend, um, certainly one which is global ICEL first or global ICEL only, at least for in terms of a you know, general purpose CPU rather than something more specialized. Um, I think the PPC is pretty good in terms of following its, um, its yeah, the patches are relatively recent, are very well structured, it's useful to follow what's been done there. Um, it's I, I think, it, for instance, if I was starting the RISC five backend work again, you know, now from scratch, I'd be very tempted to try and do global ISL only, global ISL by default, see how far you get. Um, all of the support for you know importing selection DAG patterns and for selection DAG and global ISL to coexist is fantastic, but you know naturally you are adding something to a backend rather than removing it. So it's not you know you're fundamentally not decreasing complexity by going and adding global ISL support. It would be interesting to, to hear from people on cases where global ICEL has made things easier than selection DAG. Um, for instance, if there are you know, transformations where it would either be much more difficult to implement on the selection DAG um, or easier to reason about and that kind of thing, where there's you know, a, a demonstrable advantage beyond these those kind of three um, targets um, mentioned earlier on in the presentation. There's also some practical challenges. Uh, the global ICEL documentation is good, it's useful. Um, there's been a number of previous tutorials which are you know, really, or presentations which are, are really helpful. Um, but selection DAG has a benefit of being used across every target. So I know personally when I find something that's a little bit fiddly to handle in selection DAG or there's a few different implementation strategies, quite commonly you can just go through the LVM backends, have a look at what PPC does, what x86 does, what's a, what AR64 does. Um, and then get a good idea for what the benefits or costs of, of that is and make a decision based on your target. We lack that for global ICEL right now just because it hasn't been as widely adopted. Um, I'm, I'd be interested to further explore whether, um, I, I believe that there's, it's easier to have more fine-grained operational legality for 
uh, global iCell versus uh, selection DAG. In selection DAG for um, for RD64, I64, um, so a 64-bit integer is our smallest legal type um, because of uh, kind of details related to exactly how we handle the fact that you have um, a you know, both 32 these two base ISAs. We make use of variable size register classes, um, unlike most other well every all the other targets which kind of duplicate the instructions and have logic around uh, extension of registers. Um, it ends up, it's a little bit fairly hairy to handle all of this in selection DAG. Um, I'd be curious exploring if that can be made less hairy for um, global ISL, particularly as um, there, was a, there was a fair bit of work done to try and optimize that. And then Craig Topper had a talk at a recent LVM dev meeting. Um, of course, it'd be good to explore once we get to that point, um, picking up best practices from other targets like AR64, whether it makes sense to adopt a, a lowering pass like they did. Um, and with the idea of a GI cell kind of only backend, I um, like the earlier on in the risk five backend work for some time, um, I maintained this kind of series of inc rebased incremental patches to implement um, the, the backend, um, which was I think, useful. People appreciated it. Um, I ran out of time to do it when my son was born because um, it was also a fair, a fair burden. Um, if magically a whole bunch of time appeared, um, I, I think it would be quite good fun to do the same thing for, um, but with global iCell. So it, try and trial it for GI cell only, look for opportunities to improve the documentation, the implementation, the helper classes to try and make it easier to understand and use in cases where you don't have all the selection DAG infrastructure that you're also using and the degree to which it makes the, um, the back end simpler. Um, in terms of RISC-V global iCell, I've been you know, doing some, uh, a whole bunch of downstream experimentation, um, mostly as a, I guess, a bit of a passion project to learn more about this, see what might be, what might be possible. Um, I'm planning to pull together more of what I ha what I have, help to move forward to the um, patches that are currently up for review from other people, and hopefully start pushing more stuff upstream. Uh, beyond that, it remains to be seen, kind of where I take it next, or where you know, other RISC-V um, backend contributors might be interested in taking it. Um, an important thing to highlight there is, um, you know, I'm very, very grateful for. Of course, all the global iCell uh, contributors, people who've done talks on it before, written documentation and done the implementation. On the RISC-V side, um, particularly highlighting Lewis Revel's work on global iCell, um, the initial series of patches, which actually went through a nice little cycle in that um, he did a very, very nice incremental set of, you know, the first few patches of global iCell. I think PPC are ahead of us now, but they base their initial patches on the RISC-V work, and we'll probably go and base the next set of RISC-V patches on how they handled things. So that's um, kind of nice feedback loop within the LVM community. Um, as part of that work, actually, the PPC um, devs, they have a, um, a work in progress global iCell cookbook, um, which I think they shared after a previous lightning talk. I uh, thought that was a really great idea. It goes through a list of kind of common questions or things that might be perhaps at first seem surprising about global iCell and how you can handle them. Um, it'd be good to get that reviewed and merged. Um, and of course, the global iCell docs, the previous global iCell tutorial are useful resources. Um, and as global iCell stuff moves forward, I try and highlight it in LVM Weekly. And with that, I think I think I've covered everything I had. So I'll see if anyone has any questions and see if I can be able to answer them. Thank you very much. All right, we have about fifteen minutes for questions, so lots of time to grill Alex. <laughs> Or are you all experts on global iCell already? Mm. Yeah, thanks uh, for putting that up. Um, I have a question for you as a user for global iCell. What, what could we do to make it easier to adopt? Um, So, so I mean, for me, being able to step through how other backends have handled it is super, super handy. So I've I found it. The previous BPF-based tutorial was good, but then it was fairly simplified versus the kind of things you have in a, in a real target. And so the work that Lewis kicked off on on, on RISC-V, and also the work that 
PPC did was very useful. So I, I do think there's value in trying to you know maintain that kind of step by step approach, but it, it is very very labor intensive, um, which is uh, which is the issue. I'm not really sure beyond that. I've I guess I've. I found it helpful having as all the resources that are currently available open, found them useful for different things. Hopefully this is useful in some slightly different ways. I think we're probably not, I, I don't know if there is some kind of single introduction to it all that would solve all the questions, um, but I'll, I'll let you know if I think of it. <laughs> Any other questions? Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one comment, which is, uh, to a large degree, we're currently limited by how the DAG operates, mm -hmm. because we're still like glued onto a lot of DAG infrastructure. For example, the way the calling convention lowering works is still calling to table-generated things using ABT. And on the other end, we're still using the selection DAG-generated patterns. So, so, so more or less, you're still bound by however the DAG does it. It's, it would be difficult to go off and just have totally new strategies uh, if you're trying to add to a self from what the DAG already does. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, very clear summary of everything that's been going on over the past few years. Um, and it's something I've just started looking at as well. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, looking at some of the back ends, there seems to be, oh, I, I don't know if this is a correct assumption, that there's um, maybe some table gen uh, stuff that's missing. So for example, I think it's the instruction mapping of the operands. I've seen um, we're kind of, uh, uh, some of the architectures are Kind of rolling out their own kind of table game in line. I think there's some comments to say uh, th this this should be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's something you're aware of, or or, or if there's plans to. I've I've seen the same thing as you. Um, yeah, I guess Quentin or someone else might have a better idea of what the status is or to what degree it's limited by. I guess backend specific things. But yeah, I've I've, I've had the same observation. But it looks like there's a, a number of to dos littered around about where it'd be nice to add more table gen, so there's less handwritten code. Yeah, I think that, that, that was the only pain point that I encountered, but um, yeah, thank you. So I have one question re related with support for RISD and given extensions. So is there a possibility or I, uh, to uh, separate uh, support for global ICER for given extension and for example for basic extension there is already support for for global ISO and for example I mean that for integers there is support and if you would like to to enable compiler only for integers then there will there is support and for example if you would like to use vector extension there is no support yet and yeah, you can certainly build it up incrementally. I mean, you're, you'd, you'd be kind of limited on a, a function granularity, I think, in terms of being able to to do that. But you, you'd, yeah, you'd naturally go about implementing it. I guess as it's been done so far and as it's been done on other backends, you know, the basic integer operation, start adding some floating point support, start adding in some of the other extensions. In the RISC V case, there's a whole bunch of extra work around um, uh, say all the soft float versus hard floats and the different APIs. So I think incrementally is definitely the way um, the way to handle it. Um, at, at which point it would be, you know, given you're you're still a fair way behind selection DAG, it's maybe not really worth using outside of testing scenarios until it's you know probably nearing um, parity with selection DAG. But at least in terms of testing and collaborating upstream, I think that kind of in, 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 that kind of um, step by step approach make a lot of sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. One more question. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered anything yet in what you've done that seems difficult or impossible to do in Global ISL compared to Selection Day?
Um, nothing impossible. I've got a, a list of things that I, I haven't quite figured out how to handle yet, but I think it, it's at the point where it's I haven't put it, put enough time into it what, that rather than it, it's something that I'm, I'm kind of convinced that Global iCell is getting in my way and not letting me do it. Um, so I'll... Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you an update in a few months, see if I've, I've encountered anything I haven't been able to figure out. Any additional questions? All right, thank you, Alex. The next talk will start at half past five. Thank you very much, everyone.